New Orleans has a reputation for the extreme. But with doctors safeguarding the careers of gifted athletes. Yeah, that reconstructed my whole knee. The most advanced military trauma unit. Don't touch the vein again. You got to have your target in mind. It brings sophisticated medical care far forward into the theater of war. And a team of specialists hunting down infectious diseases. Ships and planes are cutting edge as far as spreading infectious disease. The real extreme in New Orleans is answering the call for hazardous duty. 300 miles from New Orleans, at Fort Polk, Louisiana, the United States military is preparing its soldiers for war. The goal is to destroy the enemy, with troops trained to dominate a battlefield. These are the most realistic war games staged anywhere in the world. The closest most of these soldiers have ever been to actual combat. The key to winning them is survival. The first few days, I think, is survivability for all of us here. We're trying to get the tents up. We're trying to get operational, and we don't really do much classes. We're trying to figure out our roles and what we need to do. For many of these troops, this will be the last stop before being shipped off to fight the war in Afghanistan. In the next 11 days, 5,000 troops will engage in simulated battle. And combat medics will learn to save the lives of the wounded both real Do I look hurting enough? and imaginary. The war is being waged on this 100,000 acre battlefield. Instead of bullets, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you three items. They are using a laser weapon system. Uh, it's based off this thing right here, which mounts on every weapon system we have. Okay, it's just a laser transmitter. Laser comes out right here. Known as miles. And if that laser hits the sensors worn by any of the soldiers, the alarm goes off. Just like that. That's what it sounds like. And that person is assessed as a miles casualty. 100 officers are constantly evaluating the medical care these casualties receive. Which is crucial to preparing the medic trainees for combat duty. If I took you and threw you into this situation, you'd be nervous the sounds of people screaming. Oh, that's overwhelming. Does it hurt here? Major William Campbell. All right, finger in the bottom. Specializes in hospital emergency medicine. If I introduce you to that slowly and somewhat desensitize you. Blood pressure, 153. You become more effective. You're able to block all that out and function better as a medic. Would you know which direction it was pointing? Major Campbell is assigned to the centerpiece of this medical operation. The modern day equivalent of a MASH unit. A tent trauma center in the shadows of the front lines, called a cache, or combat support hospital. We treat real injuries. Okay, I've got equal breath sounds with the same standard of care as you would in a normal civilian hospital. Does that hurt? No! We just do it out in the woods. It's day one of the battle, and a chopper with a load of wounded is on its way. By the time this combat preparedness training is completed, these medics will come to be defined by their ability to respond rapidly amidst a chaos unlike any seen in civilian hospitals. The people of New Orleans take college football very seriously. More than 90,000 fans will pack the Louisiana State University Stadium to watch their gridiron gladiators do battle. Tonight, their opponent is one of their bitter rivals, Ole Miss. For the more gifted players, College football is their ticket to the pros and multi-million dollar salaries. So it's excel at any cost. 
and often that means sacrificing their bodies. If somebody comes off with an injury, we do a quick evaluation right there. Uh, something that requires an x-ray, we have x-ray right here at the stadium. And if it involves one of the team's stars, the results of that x-ray can have a huge impact. If it's negative, we'll put the individual back in in conjunction with the doctor's approval. That doctor is Brett Bankston, the team's orthopedic surgeon, a formidable sideline presence on game day. We're basically here to support the training staff to evaluate the kids on the sidelines and then treat them uh, after an injury and try to get them back to playing as quickly as we can. The staff of trainers treat the cuts, bruises, and sprains. The 41-year-old Bankston has his eye on the more serious ones. The bad injuries that we're concerned about are neck injuries or head injuries. Uh, those are ones that you really need a physician to evaluate to help the trainer make the decision whether or not a kid can return to play. With so much at stake, he's well aware of the weight that decision can carry. I try to meet with the coaches at least once a week so they know who I am, how I'm making decisions regarding whether or not a, a player can return to play. Uh, and I think that's very important. I don't need to be someone in the shadows that they don't know and they don't trust. Dr. Bankston's decisions are about to decide the future of the team's star cornerback. Hey, Robert. How you doing, Doc? You ready to go, bud? Yes, sir. Six weeks ago, 23-year-old Robert Davis badly injured his right knee. Surgery will take about an hour and a half. Since then, he has undergone physical therapy, but it's not responding. As soon as we're done, I'll have another doctor in there helping me. And, uh, Dr. Bankston now believes that Davis has a severely torn ligament that will require surgery. You know, the MRI that we got a month ago looked like it was torn off the femur, and, and since your knee keeps giving way, uh, we're going to go look at it, and if it's torn as we expect, we'll, we'll do a reconstruction. Reconstructive surgery will involve building an entirely new ligament and transplanting it into his knee. If it succeeds, Robert may still have a chance at his dream of a pro football career. The city of New Orleans is popular with tourists. It's even more popular with large commercial shipping vessels that drop anchor here from all over the world. 400 million tons of cargo pass through this port each year, making it the busiest port in the world. But sometimes, stowed away aboard these ships are silent killers, viruses and bacteria that can lead to infectious and even deadly diseases. Sexually transmitted diseases are quite common on ships, but also there's some very exotic infectious diseases which uh, present a danger from a pu public health standpoint to uh, the city of New Orleans. Okay, great. And your call sign? Jay Smith is the founder of the Marine Medical Unit. Can I see for me, please? A clinic at the port. And what's the name of the ship? That specializes in the diagnosis and treatment no constitutional symptoms of infectious diseases aboard ships what sets us apart from a normal occupational medical clinic is that we need doctors that work here that can recognize illnesses rather than injuries the leading infectious disease specialist on his staff is dr. Tlaloc Alferez have, are those their passports her 16 years experience in the field have taught her that living conditions aboard these ships can be breeding grounds for the most serious diseases. The crew members may be together from anywhere from uh, several weeks to many years. And so living together in close proximity, uh, a lot of things can be transmitted back and forth. One of the most common diseases found aboard ships is tuberculosis which affects 8 million people worldwide each year. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? And has risen by 21% in the U.S. in the past 15 years amongst immigrants. Okay. Today, Dr. Alferez and a team of two nurses and another doctor are investigating the threat of a tuberculosis outbreak on board a ship from China. 
the Lee Shan High. What we're doing is applying PPDs, what are which are TB skin tests. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because a crew member has been removed from the vessel with um, suspicious of tuberculosis, so now everyone needs to be tested. It was the ship's captain who had contacted Marine Medical and raised concerns. It will take 24 hours before the TB test results can be read. And the crew of 20 will know if anyone else is infected with the deadly virus. Yes. Mm -hmm. No problem. No problem with working. Okay. <laughs> It's day three of the 11-day simulated war being waged at Fort Polk, Louisiana. A battle that captures all the realism of the type of combat these soldiers might face in the war on terrorism. For these games, an area has been created called the Island of Aragon. The Island of Aragon is actually just cut out of the United States. Like this is Memphis up here, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and then Lake Charles. This is Fort Polk, it is right in here. The scenario calls for U.S. troops to help local guerrilla forces topple a terrorist-controlled regime on this fictional island. What's going to happen is, as the battle progresses, special forces will teach the guerrillas how to conduct better and better battles. Every move, every order has a purpose. Back up with Don't get angry. Hey, IMT saves your life, fool. To test the readiness of the doctors and medics. And the medics really come into this play as casualties occur out here. We start with the field medics who do, do emergency treatment immediately on those casualties. The field medics, known as combat lifesavers. Hey, make sure that they keep these Cretinians separated from the U.S. and NATO wounded. Patrol the battlefield risking their own lives to treat wounded soldiers gunned down by enemy fire. All my combat lifesavers have a little mini bag like this. It comes with two sets of IVs, uh, six field dressings, five cravats, some ace bandages, a splint, all the basics. Their task is to keep a soldier alive until he can be transported by ground to a nearby battalion aid station. Yep. Either way you want to wrap. Where more advanced care is available. Once they get here, we uh, double check all the treatment and intervention that was done at the site and en route. And if any further treatment needs to be done, we'll go ahead and provide the further treatment, change IV bags, get started an IV bag if it hasn't been started, check the vitals. They also determine which soldiers need to be airlifted out for further treatment. The more seriously wounded are brought here to the combat support hospital known as CASH. Don't touch the vein again. You got, you got to have your target in mind. It brings sophisticated medical care far forward into the theater of war, close enough that we can do more good to the soldiers that get hurt in the battlefield. So close that sometimes the CASH unit comes under attack. It's the price medics and doctors are willing to pay for saving lives. The way the United States Army fights at this point, we're very fast, it's a battle of maneuver. So we have to be able to pick up and move and treat and evacuate from wherever the soldiers are and they go. The first two days, casualties have been light. But on this third day, as the battle intensifies, casualties have nearly doubled and medic trainees are getting a crash course in combat trauma medicine. Throughout the 11 days of training, when I press right here, does that hurt? The eyes of officers, known as observer controllers, are focused on the medical team's performance. Observer controller's primary mission is to assist the unit in uh, its training by observing what they do, uh, making recommendations based in doctrine as to how they can improve, the other piece of what we do is we're a little bit referee. Does it hurt when I press here? Yeah. Major Campbell is one of the observer controllers at CASH. 
How about here? You feel me touching you? No. Medics inside the triage area are learning one of the toughest lessons of war. Recording. Blood pressure, 153. Prioritizing the order in which the wounded will be treated. If those patients are critically ill, some of them you may be able to save. Others, you have to realistically look at it and say, I don't have two to three hours to take care of this one individual, because if I commit that type of a um, force to saving their life, I will lose two or three more people. A soldier's injury is determined by a card issued to them at the start of battle. Well, we notice down here he's got a gunshot wound to the back. And in treating the wounded, observers are always looking for ways to heighten the realism. Frequently, they'll start IVs on each other under supervision until they become good at it. A little bit more. And that means performing under pressure. And what I've tried to do over the past couple of days is gradually introduce the medics to a more and more pressure type of situation. So the first day, I'm fairly nice. As I expect them to be able to perform under more pressure, I start to increase the, the pressure. So instead of looking at a private and going, hey, I need such and such, I might say, look at the patient and go, the patient is severely injured here. I need an IV in this patient now. I got his pulse, 85, BP, 120. Manuel Ortiz is a paramedic with the unit. We know that it's, uh, it's essentially what people call a game, but it's a very serious game and about to get even more serious. Just before dusk, commanding officers are going to test how well the doctors and medics of the cash unit will respond to coming under direct enemy attack. <laughs> 23-year-old Robert Davis, a star cornerback on the LSU football team, lives to play pro football. This day is one of the biggest of his career, and it has nothing to do with play. I mean, I think it's going to be rare that you're going to be able to get one hamstring out and, and be able to get seven and a half millimeters. The yeah. team's orthopedic surgeon, Brett Bankston, is ready to perform surgery that will repair the torn ligament in Robert's right knee. All right, Robert. Take Suffered when a 300-pound lineman fell on his leg. Get a little sleepy right here. But first, Dr. Bankston must determine the extent of the injury. It's called a pivot shift test. What we always do is examine the knee as soon as they're asleep to see what kind of instability he has. And he has a little looseness in the, in the knee, as you can see here. We'll always compare it to the other knee. And this other knee, which we're not going to operate on, as stable as a rock. That confirms the need for this surgery. The surgical team includes orthopedic surgeon Larry Ferracci. The first one's made laterally. They begin by making two small incisions in Robert's knee. First thing we'll see is the kneecap. And inserting an arthroscope. A little blood here makes it a little hard to see. At the tip is a tiny camera. And now we put a probe in the knee and just kind of feel the cartilage and see if anything's torn. As the camera explores, Dr. Bankston doesn't detect any profound damage. No articular damage here or here. Then he finds the exact spot where Robert's ligament is torn. This is the ACL right here. And it looks to be in pretty good orientation, but you can tell that it's not attached up here. When I pull on it, there's no attachment still to the femur. It's completely torn away up here. The goal is to build Robert a new ligament. But to do so, Robert must be his own donor. And so we're going to have to take one of his hamstring tendons, or maybe two of his hamstring tendons, to uh, make a new ligament to replace this one that's just is pulled off. Let's put the scope up here, turn the light off. Doctors will harvest a portion of Robert's hamstring tendon. We're looking for the hamstring tendons. There are three tendons which come and attach on the inside part of the knee, and we use those as our graft. Removing these hamstring tendons will not hinder Robert's normal movement. Once the tendons are removed, they are given to Dr. Ferracci. The graft is kind of flat right now. Uh, and all I'm doing is putting some suture in it to make it into a tubular structure. Which is more like the shape of the ligament that was destroyed. Larry, how big's the graft? What size do we need to do? Hey, I got to finish sewing it. I'll give you an idea in just a second. 
Okay. One hour into the operation, okay, cool. Dr. Bankston is ready to implant the new ligament. I don't feel him yet too well. Unfortunately, for Dr. Bankston, this surgery has become all too common. Uh, our quarterback, uh, we, he had this operation uh, done two years ago. I think we have two offensive linemen, three other defensive players who have all had reconstructions. Now we're going to fix this with a screw that just pinches the graft inside the tunnel. It's called an interference screw. <laughs> oh, that looks great. Doesn't impinge. We're going to, into full extension to see where the graft works in the knee and make sure it doesn't hit the bone like we talked about earlier. An hour and a half after surgery began, the new ligament, which was once a tendon, is now in place. But there's still one final test. So we check the lockman again just like we did at the beginning of the case, and this time it's very tight. This graft doing what it's supposed to do. His knee goes into full extension, and everything's where we want it. The operation is done, but the road to recovery will be a long and grueling one. Robert Davis's dream of playing pro football may depend on how well the repairs to his knee respond to the rigorous physical therapy he must now undergo. It has been 24 hours since the Marine medical team, led by Dr. Tulalik Alferez, administered tuberculosis tests to the crew of the Chinese ship Li Shan Hai. After one of its crew members displayed symptoms of TB. Her name is. It's time to see if anyone has tested positive for the disease. May I see your arm? One by one, the crew members will be asked to roll up their sleeves. What we are looking for is a lump where the inoculation was not just redness, but also a hardened area. So Dr. Alferez, an infectious disease specialist, draws a line across the inflamed area, then measures it. Measure. Anything above 10 uh, millimeters is positive. In Mr. Joao's case, this is clearly not even four millimeters, so it is a negative test. Ma Yu Ming. Ma Yu Ming. One after another, measurements are taken, and the test results are the same. Negative. Your skin test is negative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But that's about to change. This is a positive skin test of 17 millimeters. The man's name is Zhu Fu. That means that he has come in contact with tuberculosis and had been infected with it. Have you ever had one of these before? Before, yeah. And there's a second positive test. The chief cook, Lian Zhang Dao. Unfortunately, we found two people who have positive PPDs uh, and significantly positive one. Thank you. Good morning. Tuberculosis can be highly contagious. May I see? It's negative. That's very good. I've so the Marine Medical Thank Unit you. must not only protect themselves, they must also take every precaution to protect the general public from the disease. We also have to be aware of what steps to take to contain that problem, to keep it from going beyond the sides of the ship. Okay, okay. we have him right here. Now, please, Mr. Fush. In order to contain the disease, they must unravel the mystery of how the crew contracted it. From China. China. Where in China? Uh, the two men who tested positive will undergo extensive questioning and medical testing. Have you lost weight? In dealing with a problem such as tuberculosis on a ship, it's very important to make sure that we find the source patient. Have you been coughing? No. The source patient is the carrier. Do you drink any alcohol? The one who brought the disease on board. We need to make sure that that person does not stay on the ship. Any diabetes? There's an even more pressing concern about identifying the source patient. 
we have to make sure that they don't have a multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Mr. Hu Queen? Yeah, yeah. Multidrug resistant TB develops when patients fail to complete their course of treatment. So they are given a new drug regimen each time they're diagnosed with TB. The result is that the carriers never get cured and they risk spreading an even more dangerous strain of the disease. May I see? It's day four of the war games at Fort Polk, Louisiana. Fighting is intense. American troops are gaining ground against the enemy in their efforts to topple the terrorist regime on the mythical island of Aragon. But it's not only the enemy on the battlefield that has U.S. soldiers concerned. There's a chance that terrorists might stage a separate attack on the field hospital. So officers are going to test the readiness of the troops who guard the cache. And whether or not the medics uphold the international law that governs the care of wounded enemy soldiers, as outlined by the Geneva Convention. One of the things the Geneva Convention says, if an enemy soldier is injured, uh, the that person will be taken by the United States medical system and treated, just like one of our casualties. In fact, the Geneva Convention goes even further. All right. That soldier has wounds that are more severe and need treatment faster than American casualty. The Geneva Convention says that they'll be treated before our casualties. Uh, this can be emotionally hard, but that's how we do it in the Army. A uh, fragment wound four and a half inches long in the forehead, possible contusion of the brain. This soldier is a member of the enemy forces. He and some of his troops are going to storm the cash compound in a truck. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. He and another wounded soldier will be dumped at the front gate. I just want that to count the so second on. enemy soldier has a penetrating chest wound. Large amount of foamy blood oozing from wound. Difficulty breathing. The attack will take place near dusk. The soldiers of the cash unit are faced with their toughest challenge yet. Should they treat the wounded enemy or leave them to die? Morning. Yeah. We'll probably start you at about 70 right now. Just one day after surgery to replace a torn ligament in his knee, Football player Robert Davis is already starting his rehabilitation at the LSU Center for Athletic Training. You ended at 88 degrees. A team of trainers working closely with Robert's orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Brett Bankston, Yo, try to bump it up at least uh, 92, 93. are guiding him through his recovery. If you, if you allow us the to. program is divided into three phases. The first or the acute phase is just getting over the operation, the swelling, and getting the motion back in place. Uh, the next phase, we start working more aggressively on strengthening. So hopefully by three months, the patient is, starts running and can do some more uh, aggressive activities. We wait another three months at least before we return them to sports-specific activities. Does it hurt when I load it like that? A little bit. Like other athletes trying to come back from similar injuries. We'll work with you. You'll get back. Robert can not only look forward to a recovery program of intense physical therapy, but also to renewing his hopes of playing pro football. This CPM machine for continuous passive motion is an important tool in the first phase of his treatment. We want to just try to increase the range of motion and uh, work on quad strength. The, the, the muscles right here on the front of the leg, uh, right after the surgery like this, they, uh, they kind of tend to go into what's called atrophy. They kind of forget to work. After joint surgery, the CPM machine is used to bend and stretch the joints, which aids in healing. We'll actually let Robert center and control his range of motion as he goes. But every, every two or three uh, repetitions, we'll let him bump it up a couple more uh, degrees. We'll try to get a little farther than we did this morning, because we'll always want to progress. Progress will come slowly, 
and success will be found in the slightest achievement Robert makes each day. At the port of New Orleans. How long have you been on this ship? A marine medical team is aboard the Chinese ship Li Shan Hai. And your skin test was positive. Yeah. Would Experts in diagnosing and treating infectious diseases, they are questioning two men who have tested positive for tuberculosis. High blood pressure? Dr. Alferez and her team are trying to solve the mystery of how these crew members contracted the disease. What do you do here? I'm a sailor. Maybe. This man's name is Zhu Fu. He's been aboard the ship for seven months. Night? sweats and is not aware of having come in contact with anyone who has TB. Do you smoke? Yeah. How many packs of cigarettes a day? Medical detectives, they are trying to piece together clues. The most simple detail can be critical to their investigation. Travel is very important. Knowing what insects they may have come in contact with or different foods or water. Do you smoke? Yeah. The second man who tested positive is the cook, Liang Zhang Gao. Are you losing weight? He is 50 years old and says he has never before been tested for tuberculosis. The two men are removed from the ship. How are you all feeling? Do you feel okay? And taken to the Marine Medical Clinic for further tests. The clinic, which was founded in 1978 by Jay Smith, has a staff of 14 to treat patients, many of whom are at risk of spreading deadly diseases. Our people are the first to see those guys, so they have to be very alert and uh, very aware of symptoms that uh, perhaps the normal practitioner might not be quite so familiar with. Um, we also have to be aware of what steps to take to contain that problem. I'm Dr. Ali, nice to see you. Okay. Do you speak English? Uh, I can speak. Yeah. But just a little bit. Yeah. Often, that means quarantine. Has he been losing any weight? Yes. Over the years, the Marine Medical Unit has helped contain a number of highly infectious diseases, including malaria and hepatitis. Okay, how long has this been going on? But TB remains high on their watch list. Hold your breath. If a ship captain is not compliant uh, with our request to contain and, and analyze his crew, he can actually get a jail term for that and, uh, and a fine. Dr. Alferez orders a set of x-rays for each man. This is the first in a series of tests. Deep breath. <sighs> but tests are only part of the solution. Good deal. You can lay back. An even bigger part All right. is trust. So one has to try to make them feel comfortable so that they can tell you the truth and not just things that they think you want to hear as a physician. You're going to be on medicine for two weeks here. Two weeks for you? Here. It will take all of her years of experience as an infectious disease specialist for Dr. Tulalik Alferez to establish that trust. Okay, all right. The sun was just setting on day four of the war games at Fort Polk, Louisiana. When terrorists staged a raid on the combat support hospital known as Cash. During the raid, two terrorists were seriously wounded and left just outside the gate. As darkness sets in, American forces face their most difficult challenge yet. They must decide whether to treat the enemy or let them die. Not move. Hang on. Oh! Major Mary Del Monte, a doctor with the cash unit, knows it's not easy separating patriotism from medicine. When we took our, our Hippocratic Oath, we vowed to treat patients, you know, whether friendly or foe. Okay, we got stretchers yet? Our job is to save lives. 
right, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. Take it easy. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. From out of sight, Captain Mike Hall and other commanders watch and evaluate the cash unit's response. Doesn't look like there's anything visible. There's no blood. They're going to make sure the bad guys were chased off. <coughs> Once they have the security of the area, they're going to turn their attention to the, the casualties. All right, all right, I'm going to roll you back over, all right? They're going to make sure there's no weapons on them. Stay on your side. They're going to make sure they're not booby trapped. Okay, then you're all right. Once you have security on the patients, that's when you'll figure out what's wrong with them and then treat them. Okay, let's go. Uh, come on, buddy. The enemy soldiers are transported to the hospital tent and will be treated like one of our own. Halfway through the 11 days of training, the cash unit has treated more than 200 injured soldiers. Despite their best efforts, 10 have died. And each day, one, three, one, two, three, down. The number of casualties has increased. You usually have just a couple patients getting off the helicopter. We're trying to over, overload that system to stress all the individuals involved, to stress the supplies we have. And over time, they learn to function under that pressure. We work long days, we work long nights. We have 24-hour operations in, inside the hospital. Not poor, bad. Poor, poor, poor. But our morale stays up because we know what we're training for. And then you pull it out and you watch that tail. That's a good They're amount. training for real wartime injuries. Uh, any tubes that he could actually draw off some blood. Really and good. before this mission ends, medics will have that chance. This is where you would normally find 23-year-old Robert Davis during the football season, holding down his position as a star cornerback on the Louisiana State football team. That all changed during a game against Utah State University when he tore a ligament in his right knee. Robert now spends his days here at the LSU Center for Athletic Training. This is my second time here today. This is going to be my house basically for, what, six to eight months, so however long it take for me to um, get fully full strength again. Unfortunately, he's no stranger to this house. I had um, shoulder surgery before. I recovered fully from that and came back in a matter of no time. This recovery will require a lot more time and a lot more patience. We're just going to keep progressing every day. Man, I'm trying. How long it'll be before I can walk? That's what. That's going to depend on you. We're going to progress you every day. We're going to try to get you a couple days, put you on your feet. Today, he's experiencing some pain. It's throbbing, sharp. It's a hundred different pains all in one. It really hurts. Jack Marucci, the director of athletic training, prescribes hot and cold whirlpool treatments to relieve pain. This pool here is a cold whirlpool, and it runs about 55 degrees. These other two whirlpools are our warm whirlpools. They run about 103 degrees. A player will soak in the cold pool for 15 minutes, and then the warm pool for 15 minutes. Use a cold and hot, try to pump the swelling out, um, try to get better range of movement uh, through the warm whirlpool. What we got to do, that machine over there again? Yes. Pain is part of the recovery process. But over time, it will fade as Robert's injury heals. Freaking exercise bother you very much at all? No, not too much. Good. At the Marine Medical Clinic. Thank you very Thank you. much. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Tulalik Alferez is about to examine the Say chest x-rays. This is our first patient. They are the x-rays of two crew members from the Chinese ship Li Shanghai, who tested positive for tuberculosis. And he's got some old granulomatous disease, doesn't he? Sure Look at does. That. She has been joined by another infectious disease specialist, Dr. Mark Alon. But there's no weight loss and no um, night sweats. They are trying to figure out which of the two men is the source patient. Chest x-ray. Now, he may have something here. The one who carried the disease aboard the ship. 
we must make sure that we have the source strain and the sensitivities of that strain. If patients have had TB before, it could very well be, but not completed their course of prescribed medication, night sweats. they can develop a strain of TB resistant to certain drugs, posing a serious health problem to themselves and the public. The single most important risk is a patient that does not know what they're up against and does not understand the need to be um, faithful to their therapy. His PPD was 17 millimeters. One of the clues they look for is scarring or damage in the lungs. I wonder if this isn't complex. This is an indication of tuberculosis from an earlier infection having spread to different areas of his lungs. All right, now this man is 53 and he smokes. They move on to the x-ray of the second patient, the ship's cook. And he has been coughing. His x-ray reveals what Dr. Alferez has been searching for. The ship's cook, Lian Zhang Gao, is the source of the TB aboard the ship. She must find a way to tell him without scaring him. Many of these people want to run away. And if he runs, he can trigger an outbreak of tuberculosis, putting the lives of tens of thousands of unsuspecting people at risk. The 11-day war games are drawing to a close at Fort Polk, Louisiana. Every day they learn more and more, and they, they leave here much improved. Do you want to flip and I'll catch? During this final day of fighting, the enemy will admit defeat. And order will be restored to the make-believe island of Aragon, where terrorists threaten to overthrow the democratic government. But the simulated war has produced more than simulated injuries. We have a couple thousand people doing continuous operations at a high rate of speed. And in do just doing that generates real casualties. Paramedic Manuel Ortiz is one of them. Well, we are in the landing zone. The heat is extremely high. So with all the equipment, I got a little dizzy. Came in, so I had to lay down and go down. <laughs> I got my high-speed medics over here that taking care of me, son. He will rest, drink fluids, and should be able to return to active duty within two hours. Specialist Richard Karenston is another real casualty. I'm digging trenches, and I hit a rock and then pick, spun that way, and my pop, felt pop right across my wrist. He's having the cast removed. It has crimped all the way up against my thumb. And a new one put on. Doctors and medics of the Cache Combat Support Hospital will now return to their homes and bases. Combat ready to be deployed to the front lines. To join in the fighting in Afghanistan and America's war on terrorism. Most of the medics that I've talked to have said things like, this has prepared me more than the entire time I've been in the military already. All right, get a tourniquet and go ahead and get her set up for an IV here. What we were presented with was a very, very good hospital. One of the best hospitals I've ever seen. As the war on terrorism continues around the world, these training missions will take on a higher level of importance. We have very good doctors. Let me get a large pad to put on the bleeding here, please. And they take their jobs very seriously. Okay, we need to get some fluid started oh. now. Because it's a serious mission to defend the country. What I gotta do next? I'm gonna probably gonna wrap you up. When Louisiana State University football player Robert Davis emerged from surgery to repair a torn ligament in his knee, he put his faith in the recovery program at the school's Center for Athletic Training. This is Robert's senior year, so he won't be playing again for the LSU Tigers. What did you do with this over the weekend at all? But he's not ready to hang up his spikes and call it quits. I'm gonna try to um, 
play pro ball somewhere. Although there are moments when fear and doubt creep in. In the back of your mind, you kind of think, I, I had this surgery, my leg is kind of hurting, and you, you think, man, what if you hurt your leg again? Then you got to go through this all over again. Orthopedic surgeon Brett Bankston is confident in Robert's ability to make a complete recovery. Robert's a high-level athlete. He's in great physical condition. And the better physical condition, the easier it is for us to rehab or get someone, get someone back from an injury like this. Hold this together and I'll put the straps on for you. Dr. Bankston looks beyond Robert's dream of playing in the pros. Robert Davis may or may not want to play professional football at some level. Uh, that's not really our concern. Our concern is the health of his knee long term. Hopefully we'll give him a knee that'll be good for the rest of his life. But if he should choose to walk that path and play pro ball, he'll do it with the aid of a flexible knee brace designed to help minimize the risk of future injuries. You get a lot of blows that impact on the, uh, we call it the lateral or the outside of the knee. The brace tries to disperse that blow so that ligament is not stretched or torn. If Robert Davis makes it to the pros, it will be due in part to the doctors and trainers who, in rebuilding his knee, gave him back his dream. Two crew members from the Chinese ship Li Shan Hai, who tested positive for tuberculosis, are arriving at the Marine Medical Clinic to meet with Dr. Tulalik Alferez, an infectious disease specialist. Hello, how y'all doing? They will be hearing for the first time the results of their chest x-rays. And he smokes several packs of cigarettes a day. Primary care physician, Dr. Mark Alon, is also present, as is the ship's captain. Dr. Alferez explains that the x-rays reveal scarring inside the lungs of the ship's cook, Lian Zhang Gao, who they have identified as the one who carried the disease on board the ship. Dr. Alon and I believe that your chest x-ray has old disease of tuberculosis. His drug therapy will be determined after he undergoes a CAT scan and biopsy of his lungs. I don't think that you are in danger, mm -hmm. okay? You're going to get... Dr. Alferez reassures him that if he follows the prescribed treatment, he can expect a full recovery. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to get well, mm -hmm. all right? He you have any So your chest x-ray is positive. The doctors also meet with the other crew member and explain to him that his x-rays reveal early stages of tuberculosis. Similar. But he is not as contagious as the ship's cook. Okay. The two men will be on medication for at least nine months. They will also be on board the Li Shan Hai when it leaves the port of New Orleans in two weeks, bound for China. We will actually issue a written letter for the ship that will state basically that everyone on the ship that needs to is being treated prophylactically no to right, prevent no. the outbreak of the disease in the future. Thank you. The two men will have with them a complete file containing their x-rays and medical reports so they can continue their treatment at home. Okay, good. That sounds good. They are symbols of the war fought each day by the Marine Medical Unit to keep the people of New Orleans safe from deadly infectious diseases. In New Orleans, everything is done to an extreme. From its celebrations and its cuisines to its cultural traditions. Despite these vivid displays, there will always be those for whom hazardous duty will be their idea of living life to extremes.